Now we'd like to switch focus from the CLI client to the web base module supported by Apache. We wanted to show you the basics, of course, which we have, which includes connecting to a database. That's the most important part of enabling your web application using PHP or any scripting language, for that matter, which is dynamic in nature. If it's dynamic in nature, then that means it consults a database for reads and writes, which means you will need to create connection objects and reuse them across multiple scripts, potentially servicing multiple concurrent users. So having said all of that, now we want to focus on the module, but the module focus is similar. We won't be calling the script from the shell, though we certainly can, which is the beauty behind running PHP scripts on your system in that you can make your tests or perform tests from the shell as well as from the web browser or web application. We're going to be covering some basics behind HTML forms, which includes get and post or get and post type methods, which include submitting variables in the URL, as well as, as form, standard form variables behind the scenes, and processing them using PHP, with the ultimate focus, of course, on getting those variables into your database, so inserting them into your database, which leads to updates, deletes, and so on. Now HTML supports forms, and forms have various types of fields. So let's call this section HTML forms with PHP. So HTML again supports various types of form fields, including input, as well as radio, check boxes, select boxes, or multi-option boxes, and different types of forms that you will normally find on the web today. We're going to go ahead and define a very simple form which will accept first name and last name, two of our columns from the employees table. If you recall, let's MySQL in. We'll use HR3 followed by show tables, followed by describe employees and you'll see that it contains ID, first name, last name, and pay scale ID. But we're going to write a form which will accept first name and last name and then use a back-end PHP script to upload those values into the MySQL 5 database. Of course, working under the assumption that the DBMS will provide the ID column because if a null is submitted it means to auto increment the column and pay scale ID will accept nulls it isn't required but we can populate it later on as well a simple HTML form can be defined using any text editor we're gonna use gedit because it's convenient so let's open a separate shell and we'll launch gedit a separate instance of gedit that is and we'll define a new HTML form once we have the form saved, we'll attempt to access it via the web browser. So a simple form looks like the following. We want to open with form and close with form, but certainly we're not done yet. When we open a form, we must specify the method that is to be used for submitting variables, whether we're going to post or use get for transmitting variables from the form to the server. So we'll specify a method initially of get and this will send variables to the URL followed by an action the action is what occurs when the user submits the form you've seen time and time again submit buttons or next on web-based forms well when you click on next or submit what really happens is the action portion of the form definition if you simply do a view source on the page you'll see that it simply says where or what the action should be when the user submits the form. So in our case, our action is going to be a script called action.php, which we've yet to define. And since it's the HR table, let's call it HR, or the HR database, let's call it HR3 underscore action.php, and we'll ultimately label or name this particular HTML form HR3 underscore, or HR3 dot HTML or .php. Either or will work. If you want to embed PHP code into your HTML form, then name the file with the suffix of .php, and then you'll be able to embed the PHP logic into it. So that's what we'll do from the outset. So here's the 
opening and closing tags for the definition of our form. The method is get, which means that when variables fname and lname for first name and last name are submitted, they'll appear on the URL string, and our action page will know or need to know to parse the variables from the URL string. In between the form, we define the fields that we'd like to accept of all types that are supported by HTML. We can go all out and define any type, but we want to match the types as closely as possible to the definition of your database. So the describe that we just ran told us that our database accepts ID, first name, last name, pay scale ID, with F name and L name being the current focus, and these two fields are text type fields. So the perfect field for textual information within an HTML form is simply called a text type field, which is defined using input type equals text. The size is what will be displayed on the screen, and we want to match the size somewhere close to what's accepted by the database. The database accepts 30 characters for first name, 20 characters for last name. So let's set size equal to 30 for first name, and we'll need to name the field. Each field within an HTML form needs a unique name. Name is equal to F name in this case. For simplicity, we'll name the form field the same name that's accepted by the DBMS. It is not a requirement. We could call this particular field first name or any other name that we'd like, and then once it's submitted to the action page, which we've yet to define, we'll then process or interpolate the fields and render them appropriately to the database before inserting them. So at insert time, when we actually perform an insert DM, DDL, DML statement, that is, we'll then need to label the fields properly, or at least specify that our values come from our named fields. But for consistency and to avoid confusion, it's ideal that you name your fields with consistent names. If the name is F name in the database, name it F name in the form. L name, L name, and so on. So here's a field. This is a field, although we've yet to see it in the browser, and we'll prefix it with some text such as the following, first name colon. And that's all that's required. Let's duplicate this effort for the last name field. And we'll simply rename first to last, and we'll rename F name to L name, and we'll also change the size of the field from 30 to 20. For consistency in presentation, you may want to make both sizes the same, although within the database they, the fields will accept larger values, but simply for consistency in the presentation of the form, you may want to use the same size. So here are our two fields. Now what else is required? We need a submit button, a button that will be generated by HTML aware clients, in other words web browsers. The way you define that particular submit button without using any fancy images is to simply specify input type equals submit. We'll give it a name of submit and a value equal to submit. And this will define our submit button for us. And once set, we can save this particular document. Let's save it. We'll save it in our home directory and then we'll move it over, but we'll save it in home PHP 5 and then move it over as a privileged user or change the privileges for the user to be able to write to the web location. Now let's call this HR3, that is, so HR3, and here it's actually .php. This will be saved in the default directory. Once saved as a form, or a format that's recognized by gedit, it colorizes the values for us. Now let's go ahead and ensure that we can access this via the browser by publishing the file to a web accessible location. On our system that means serve docs. This is the web accessible location. But the currently logged in user doesn't have the proper permissions to write documents to that location so we'll do so as root where we're currently logged in to this particular TTY. Let's copy hr3.php to serve docs, and you'll notice that the file doesn't contain any execute permissions. Had we run the PHP script via Apache as, or Apache using P 
PHP as a CGI rather than as a module, then this script would require execute permissions, as is the case with Perl and other scripting languages. But because Apache is a module, or a PHP is running as an Apache module, that is, and because Apache knows to, to process files with the suffix of PHP as well as PHP 5 and other similar suffixes using the PHP module, the execute permission isn't required. As long as the web user is able to read the contents of the file, it will be able to parse and process the content of the file. So it doesn't need to be owned by Apache, but as long as Apache can read it, that's all that's required. From a browser, and before we do so, let's ensure that Apache is running. Let's RC Apache to status, and it's not running, so we'll execute RC Apache to start. And then from a browser, we'll attempt to hit hr3.php. So let's connect to localhost forward slash hr3.php. And you'll see we have a simple web form, first name, last name, albeit as well as a submit button on the same line. If you want to rectify the situation, just include a soft return at the end of each input field, and this will work wonders. We'll save changes, rerun the copy statement, and then re-hit the web page and you'll see that the fields are now lined up vertically. So here's a simple field, but if we click on submit with no values, it attempts to call, as you can see, the hr3 underscore action dot php script, which currently doesn't exist. And notice, because our method is currently get as promise, the variables are being passed, and these are name value pairs, with the name being f name in the first instance and the value being blank and the second variable's name being L name and its value being blank and submit was actually submitted which doesn't need to have a name but notice that these values are blank they're undefined but at least they exist the name of the fields in the URL so when using get as your method when using or when using HTML forms that is variables are reflected in the URL string and they need to be parsed from the URL string as a result. We did mention that the submit button doesn't actually need to have a value par passed over to the action page unless of course we're sending a value. If we're not sending a value it's unnecessary. Let's submit again and notice now only F name and L name are sent but again they're blank. If we did place values in here such as a new employee's name, let's ensure that my name isn't in there as an employee, although it would be nice if I were, so I could get a paycheck from the company, but maybe another time. Let's go ahead and select star from employees to ensure that we're inserting a unique employee, and we certainly are. So we'll go ahead and specify my name and click on submit, and you'll see that the values are available in the URL string. F name equals Dean, L name equals whatever it happens to be equal. And you can specify spaces in your fields as well. Let's say we wanted to put in the last name field my full name with a space separating both names. The URL handles that space appropriately, either using percent %20 or a plus in this case, indicating that it's a space, and will be preserved and parsed correctly by PHP. So don't worry about spaces being in the values. But for now, we'll return to the original setup, which sends just by first name and last name to the action page. However, the action page doesn't exist, and this is the page that will process the variables for us. Now defining that page is quite simple because PHP provides the variable space for accessing variables that are sent via the URL, defined as session variables, implemented as cookies, or even as standard form post variables. So there's a method for the madness or there is a variable space for each type of possible variable that can be defined within the web application space. We just chose to go with get as our initial attempt. So we're going to create a new window here because we want to define the action page. And since this is a page that will perform variable interpolation, we will open with standard PHP 
tags, open tags, processing tags, these are the short tags, and we'll close with standard PHP close tags. And everything we do in between the open and close tags will be interpolated by PHP or processed by PHP. So the PHP processing engine searches the script or the document if Apache hands it off to it. Now Apache, just so you understand the logic, Apache takes any file with a suffix of .php that's called and feeds it into the PHP module. The PHP module then searches the document and it looks for its tags or recognizable tags such as open, less than symbol, followed by question mark which is really a short tag, followed by close symbols or close tags which really is represented by a question mark followed by a greater than a symbol. And optionally, we can open the tags by specifying simply PHP, or if you turn on ASP style tags, you could use the percent symbol as a means for tagging your PHP code. But we'll go with what's considered standard for PHP, which is simply the question mark after the less than and before the greater than symbols, respectively, for opening and closing tags, respectively. So we need to parse this information. Now, when information is passed to PHP using get URL style variables, we will need to use an array that's defined for storing these name value pairs called the request array. So there's a special structure set up called request. And request will allow us to access each of those variables. For example, f name. And we'll do so also for last name. So we can echo both of these variables using request and let's specify L name. And we can also set these variables from the request array to other local variables that will be used within the script, perhaps for inserts into MySQL. Well, we could have a simple echo statement which will use the request array and extract from the, the request array the F name variable followed by the L name variable. And we could, of course, prefix all of this and include any static text that we'd like to define. But the simplest test is always to ensure that your variables are making it the way you're submitting it, which is to simply attempt to print whatever variables have been sent from the form page. Let's go ahead and save this. There's nothing else we want to do at this stage. We don't want to upload to the database just yet. And we'll call this hr3 underscore action dot php. And once we've copied hr3 underscore action dot php to a web accessible location, we'll begin the debug process. Let's go to a shell and we'll find the, the window that's open that's logged in as root and we'll copy hr3 underscore action dot php to serve www.htdocs and again the document does not need to be executable. Let's lsltr star dot php and you'll see that these documents are simply read writable by the owner and readable by everyone else on the system or who has access to the system. So now the action page is in a web accessible location. Let's attempt to submit the variables again and begin the debug process. We'll click on submit and the page is blank because we're missing a comma between the two variables. Let's go back and place that comma in. And that's what's missing. We'll save it and copy it again. We need to separate the variables by using a comma. And let's try it again. We'll click on submit and there are the two values, first name as well as last name. So this tells us that each value is being read properly or appropriately by PHP. It's being parsed and that's excellent. And this is using the get method which extracts the variables from the URL string. Now sometimes web developers would prefer not to transfer information using the URL string. One part and part partially due to the fact that the URL string is limited in comparison to the body of an HTML file and two simply because it seems to disclose sensitive information, although information transferred via the HTML body is also in clear text unless, of course, the communication is between the client and the server relies upon SSL. And if that is the case, then the URL string is also unparsable. But sometimes it's more ideal to pass these values using the post method or using the HTML body. So to do so, simply modify the form 
to send its information using post method equals post and this isn't case sensitive and this will not send the values using the URL string but then we'll need to update our action page replacing request with post so let's go ahead and do a replace to replace request with post instructing our script to search for the variables in the post array and now that both files have been updated let's copy hr3 action as well as hr3.php to serve docs and both have been updated let's return to the form page refresh and we'll be sure that the values have been updated in the form by clicking on view source we want to see the page source and this will show us that the method is now post rather than get which means that when we click on submit you won't see the variables above but they still show up on the page because they're being sent in the body of the HTML message so super so we've shown you get and post which are really basics behind HTML forms but this is the foundation or we're laying the foundation for creating web applications that use dynamic repositories such as DBMS's ideally you need to understand the basics or the foundations behind HTML form programming and the basics start with simply two input fields first name last name then it gets more complex such as using radio buttons or check boxes or select boxes and once you've mastered the different types of fields that are possible using HTML then you need to master the back-end script which is the way or the means of handling that information or at least fixing the information before or massaging it before uploading it to a DBMS once you've grabbed the, the, the variables you can apply any PHP function to them that's appropriate for strings digits and so on and then after you've cleaned up the data connect to the DBMS check your connections using the syntax that we've shown you and insert the data if that's what your goal is to do or to update it or whatever your goal is whatever DML statement you intend to perform so back to our notes for a second we've covered get variables appear in URL string and we've covered post variables appear in HTML body these are the two most commonly used variables with HTML forms once submitted to an action page so we'll also mention HTML forms submit data to action pages or to an action page we should say to in well since there are multiple forms to action pages action pages process the get slash post variables and presents them to the DBMS in our case MySQL so once we've gotten that data it's time to massage it, clean it up, check for consistency, check that it's appropriate, it meets our data requirements, and then insert it into the database. So next we're going to continue working on HR3 underscore action dot PHP. So now that we've successfully implemented post base variables, in other words, we're using the post method in the form, we have the variables on the action page, but we did decide that we want to process the variables for upload to database or to the DBMS. The form page sends h3action.php processes and all is well in the world. And if you wanted to add some space between these two variables, simply just include as one way of many ways of doing it, just simply include double quotes with nothing in it and this will include a space. Let's go ahead and copy that action page over again and we'll return to the form page and then submit it and it places a space. There are other ways and there are other escape sequences such as backslash T for tabs and so on that can aid you in using the echo command for formatting output or the printf command for formatted output. Well, We now know that we have the variables. Here's a piece of advice. Once you've confirm that variables are successfully being sent to your action page you should either turn on register globals which will make your variables that are in the post array available as local names such as f name l name 
or set them yourself so that when you construct your SQL queries it isn't as messy as insert into certain columns values equals dollar sign underscore posts bracket single quote the name of the variable single quote bracket so in other words just reassign the variables it's nice and clean and it's a bit redundant but it makes it very easy to follow let's go ahead and reassign those variables we'll define one called f name and set it equivalent to the value that you see here let's just cut it from here because we don't need to retype it and then let's set l name equivalent to a similar but using the l name variable this will reassign or assign that is the post variables f name and l name to local variables f name and l name so that we can reuse that information using less syntax or less characters now that that are they're available we are free to go ahead and echo them let's just get rid of this particular line by commenting it out and on a separate line let's echo simply f name with a prefix of first name followed by a colon and a space followed by last name and we should include a space here followed by a colon and a space and the last name variable and then we'll close the line out and it should print exactly the same and we'll need to copy hr3action.php to the web accessible location and then resubmit the form and notice first name followed by last name prints which tells us that the assignment to local names f name and l name worked successfully or worked so now that we know that we have the variables available locally it's time to set up our environment for upload to the database this is very simple again it's based on our four step process or four steps to DBMS success again those steps include creating the connection which you know is very easy to do so let's go ahead and take this logic that you have here including the error check after we don't need the MySQL server information being outputted to the user's web browser but it would be nice to have the connection object otherwise we'll be unable to upload so there's the connection object now it's a bit redundant because if you're going to use the connection object in multiple places such as once in the HR form page which we're not using now but could and followed again by the action page and potentially by other pages throughout your web application you should use server side includes to include this information so it's not redundant commonly you'll find with PHP based applications that there's some sort of file that controls database connectivity usually called DB connect so let's go ahead and define our file we'll call it dbconnect.php and we'll save the contents of this particular file now you are free to op open the tags and close the tags that'll work as well for interpolation and then we'll file save and call this particular file dbconnect.php so let's launch this as the following or save it as the following and then copy it to the web accessible location and usually dbconnect.php is stored in a location that isn't directly web accessible so you may perform includes from locations that are outside of the web root let's copy dbconnect.php to serve www.htdocs and since it's there this portion which is common to all connection processes will be stored in one file rather than being repeated multiple times so since it is common just cut the redundancies as you do with DBMS's but what isn't common are steps 2, 3, and 4 which includes definition of the query, execution of the query, and output of the query but the connection object should remain constant as long as you're talking to the same database but then you could always use a MySQL select DB to change the database context within the script that's that you're working on. So to include the contents of this file simply execute an include db connect.php and if it's outside of the web accessible space then you'll need to specify the full path 
And once dbconnect.php is available, we proceed to steps two, three, and four. So let's label this area as dbms connectivity. Step one, as you know, we'll use cstyle comments. This is step one, which is create connection object. Step two, is to define SQL query for MySQL. And as you know, we've used a variable called query1. Let's just copy it. But this time, it's going to be an insert. We just want to copy the prefix and then reword it to suit our needs. So this time, we're going to insert fname and lname into the database structure. We're using the HR3 table, and we need a simple insert statement which resembles the following. An insert into, and again, you type it in similar to the way you would type it in in the MySQL terminal monitor. The name of the table, employees, followed by the columns that you'd like to insert. Let's go with F name, L name, and you could use the alternate syntax, the set syntax as well. That works just as well. For now, we're not doing pay scale ID. We're just doing the two columns, and we'll specify values. And in between the parentheses, the columns values. And rather than specifying the full post followed by the enclosed value within the brackets and the single quotes, we'll just now specify dollar sign f name followed by dollar sign l name. And this makes it much more readable. So our simple insert statement will insert into f name and l name in the proper order, no differently than using the MySQL terminal monitor, the values f name, l name. Now we did mention earlier that interpolation occurs for variables when using double quotes. This is one exception where the variable interpolation will still work. Because we are do indeed using double quotes, but we are nesting our variables within single quotes. But rest assured that the variables will be interpolated, as you'll see momentarily, when the insert actually works. So this is the definition of the query. As you know, step three is to execute the defined SQL query. So for step three, we want to proceed with our, and we are jumping to the wrong window here, we want to proceed with the result one logic here, and we can embed it in an if statement, but we won't be doing any output in, of the values. We're simply going to insert, but we could still use an if block to ensure that it returns a successful value. So let's go ahead and take this if block, paste it into HR3 action, and where we open our curly braces, let's just ensure that this looks right here. We open curly braces and then close curly braces. So if result one executes, so if the query is successful, perhaps we'll echo to the screen, query executed successfully. That could be our step four. So let's go ahead and set that up. We'll simply echo query executed successfully. We could echo the values if we'd like, but we've already done so earlier on in this action page, so it is unnecessary at this stage. We'll follow this up with a BR, a soft return, in the event that we want to print something else, or a P or any other HTML tag will work. And this is what will run. So if it runs, then that's what will happen. And if it's not successful, else, We'll just copy this particular statement and simply say query did not execute successfully. Or perhaps to make it much clearer, query failed. Please check syntax slash connection slash etc. So we have three steps. This is an insert query, and there isn't a fourth step per se, although it's sort of step 3A, because step 3 is to execute the query. Step 3A is to determine whether or not the query ran successfully, and either 
echo that the query did run successfully or echo that the query failed. So this is effectively our step four. A typical step four for us would be to output the results of the query or the result set, but that is unnecessary in this particular example. So let's recap what we have set up here. When the form page hr3.php sends over using the post method its two variables fname and lname, we will then assign those two variables to two local variables called fname and lname for simplicity. It isn't required, but it makes the syntax clean, especially when you are defining SQL queries which rely upon single quotes and so on. Once that's out of the way, we've decided to print the values just to ensure that what we did send is what the server did receive. Then we move on to DBMS connectivity. In the, the DBMS connectivity section, the steps include including dbconnect.php which sets up a connection object and if the connection object fails an error will be returned and the script will exit. The host, username, password and default database are all listed in the dbconnect.php which gets included as step number one. If this is successful which is handled by dbconnect.php's logic in the if section if it is indeed successful, step two occurs, which is the definition of our SQL query, which is to insert into the employees table for the two columns, fname and lname, the values, the local values, fname and lname, which will be interpolated properly despite being enclosed within single quotes. This is one exception. Step three is to execute the defined query. And we again have wrapped the execution of the query within an if statement to ensure that if a false value is returned we will catch it and if it does return cleanly we will also catch it we could optionally have tested if it failed and simply echoed failed otherwise echoed nothing or perhaps taken a different step such as sending the user to another page that is which is generally considered to be a landing page so if things do work, we may want to send or branch off and send the user one place. What we're doing so are emulating sending users to different locations by simply echoing the query succeeded or the query failed. And if all goes well, the script terminates. It doesn't send the user anywhere. There are no redirects. Nothing else happens. But what will happen is there will be a new value created within the table employees. Let's go ahead and update our hr3action.php script and once that's in place let's begin the debug process. We'll return to the form and we'll submit Dean Davis and notice it printed and it also said query ex executed successfully all on one line because it isn't echoing a BR or a paragraph or any table structure to cause new lines. So after first name and last name are echoed we're not sending to the screen what we could be sending such as a P for paragraph. So let's go ahead and send a P and attempt to upload that value again after having copied the action page back to the web accessible location. We'll submit and now we have our result on separate lines. First name, last name on the same line. Query executed successfully means that we've branched out to the first section of the if block which means it did run successfully and of course we can confirm by connecting to MySQL using any means that's available including the terminal monitor and rerunning our select from star from employees where you'll find that the DBMS has auto incremented the ID column twice for the two submits or the two inserts as well as default null values for pay underscore scale underscore ID We've neglected to provide a value for pay underscore scale underscore ID, but we certainly could. We could even send a default value if that suits the application. For example, in this page, we could go ahead and just define pay underscore scale underscore ID and set it to a default of 20. And that will be our default. Then in the insert statement, we'll simply include pay underscore scale underscore ID and set it to the current value for pay underscore scale underscore ID. Let's go ahead and set that and this will be inserted. Now I'm sure that all of this is on one line and they are just by 
witnessing the value here for line. It's still line 15 regardless of where we toggle up or down. And then connect to the server after having updated the HR3 action page. We'll connect again and try to see if it'll accept a default value for PayScale ID for the user Dean Davis. Also, let's separate first name and last name on separate lines so that it's nice and neat. So here's first name, and prior to last name, let's go ahead and send a BR. And because we are, we're sending a BR, we don't need the space, the leading space. And let's return to the browser, return to the form field, or the form page with the two form fields. And here we have first name, last name, separate lines, a paragraph, and then, which is equivalent to two soft returns, and then query executed successfully which leaves us to double check MySQL terminal monitors output by simply executing a select star and there's the default pay scale ID so in certain values is certainly trivial it's not a big deal whatsoever providing your syntax is defined properly and you define your syntax properly by clarifying your variables defining local variables to make it nice and clean and then using standard MySQL statements and again notice that with this insert statement similar to our select statement from the command line interface we did not terminate the statement with a semicolon because the MySQLi driver provides the terminating semicolon for us as a default so now this value or these values are being uploaded into the DBMS the DBMS has no checks for uniqueness if we describe employees you'll see that there are no checks which is why we were able to insert Dean Davis twice. Had we set primary keys on F name and L name, then it would not be permitted, the insert of the same name, and an error would be thrown to the PHP page, which would have to handle it gracefully. In fact, this particular block would have returned query failed, and we could have optionally included the actual output from the MySQL server based on the redundant information or duplicate values found. So as it stands, we're inserting data. Now what if we wanted to know the number of rows affected by the query? We did mention that that is a cool or useful function that you'll want to invoke. So if the query did e indeed e execute successfully, also echo or use printf, that'll work as well. Let's printf affected rows followed by percent %d because it's returned as an integer or as a digit that is or a numeric followed by the connection object which is called con1 object oriented notation followed by affected underscore rows being the method and this will return the number of rows affected by the insert query let's return to the form field and attempt to submit again and let's just double check our print we didn't copy the script over the action page which is why it's not doing it so let's go back and do that again and try it once again and you'll see affected rows one we inserted one row because we submitted only one row of information but MySQLi's methods able to return that information to us and there are many more methods that are useful but you'll find that affected rows as well as number of rows are used quite frequently Super. So we're now inserting data into the MySQL table without any problems whatsoever. There are all sorts of tricks that you could apply to adjust the way data is inserted and checked. For example, let's say that it's a requirement of your form that one or maybe more than one, maybe all of the fields, since we only have two fields, are required. We'll start with one, of course. Let's say that first name is a required field and you want to cease processing on the action page in the event that the field is unset or blank you could use is set for example let's say the field is not set if it's not set you could cause the script to halt using is set or if it's blank you could also cause the script to halt so that garbage data is not inserted so you can perform those types of functional checks against your data to ensure that garbage isn't inserted and you'll find often with web forms that the checks wherever possible are performed up front but for more sophisticated web, sophisticated web applications the checks are also performed on the back end 
so that in the event that the user has the JavaScript technology disabled, the front end checks are simply turned over to the back end. But in other words, it's usually def defined as a two phase check, front end as well as back end, to ensure that missing fields are caught. So that's something else to keep in mind. But what we've done up to this point, although not really complicated, is set up DBMS connectivity to the MySQL DBMS. We're inserting data. If you wanted to create a page that would dump the contents of the HR table for or the employees table in the HR3 database, that would be real easy as well. So here's HR3. We could use this particular logic, the select logic from the action page, setting up the connection and so forth to dump the info. Let's go ahead and take this DBMS connectivity that you see here, this whole block, and we're going to create a new page. Of course, it must begin with PHP tags and end with PHP tags, or wherever you use PHP, include the tags, which includes in between HTML. We'll paste the DBMS connectivity information and save this document as HR employees list dot PHP. This script will simply dump to the web page the list of employees or the fields that we select. So you know that you need a database connection and this connection relies upon the HR3 table. So let's just close DB Connect because we know the defaults are right. If it fails, the script will halt. Step two is to alter the query. Instead of inserting, we want to select F name, L name, as well as pay underscore scale underscore ID from employees. And if you want to perform a join so that the pay scale value is actually returned, go ahead and perform the join in the query, then execute the query. Once the query has run, now we'll need the while logic to output the columns. So let's go ahead and take the while logic that you see here and nest it in between and we'll place it in between the if block and the else statement. So the query did run successfully. We know that obviously if we've gotten to this branch and what we'll do is just output the results outputting F name, L name as well as pay scale ID. Let's set this up object one and this will be pay underscore scale underscore ID. So now we have the three values and the ID is an integer so we should include it as percent %d and the three values will be returned. If you want to nest HTML in you can do it within the printf. You may also use the other MySQL functions to return these values such as accessing them directly using array elements. That will certainly work as well. But as it stands this will cause a print of each particular employee followed by a new line which includes the columns that we're interested in. And this is called hrlist.php. So let's go ahead and attempt to run this query. We'll copy it. And again, it doesn't need to be executable. So hr3 employees list. Over to serve docs. Notice the name is slightly different. It doesn't have the three, but that's okay. We'll just copy it from here and paste it into the browser and begin the debug process. So the form is very simple. It doesn't get more simpler than two fields. It's as simple as they come. And now we begin the debug process to see what's happening with the select statement and the output of our records. So we have our DB connection set up and here is query, this is the wrong, here's query number one which is incorrect so we must have specified it in the wrong place. Let's go ahead and take this from here. We ended up on the wrong page and overwrite query one. This is taking an insert which isn't throwing an error so it's inserting nothing. This is the new query one and we'll copy it again and try that again. Let's return to the browser and begin debugging. So hrlist is executing select f name l name pay scale id from employees and result one invokes connection one with query one and it fetches the objects for first and this says first instead of f name so this is incorrect it's f name had we specified 
select f name as first that would have worked let's try this again return to the browser refresh it and this should be just a slight bug in the script let's take a brief look again at that logic this is all a part of scripting and notice that the while statement is missing a terminating curly brace which is causing it to not terminate super additionally let's include instead of the backslash n let's include a br after the payscale ID numeric value so that after each row a new line is created using the soft return HTML tag so we needed to terminate the while loop which happens to be nested within the if block let's try that again and there are the employees first name last name followed by payscale ID for all of the values so this is again very very simple and even in a simple example it will likely to turn up bugs but it illustrates the point that we're able to insert as well as select which means we'll also be able to update as well as delete we can delete and see how many rows were affected and that certainly would work so we could match based on what's specified in the form for example let's take the form that's HR3 that's, select, that's submitting into HR3 action instead of selecting or instead of inserting we could delete where the two criteria match we'll delete from employees where F name is equal to what's specified by F name and in this case that would be the form F name followed by L name is equivalent to dollar sign L name and this will delete all instances of whatever names are specified for first name and last name but they both must match because of the where and and clauses but this will affect a delete and then return the, the affected rows to us let's update HR3 action and copy it over Let's find a shell interface. We'll copy HR3 action back to there and return to the form field, which is simply HR3. And again, when this submits, instead of inserting, it will delete. So let's specify Dean Davis, and it's case insensitive. And let's click on submit. And notice five rows were affected. Let's confirm which five rows were affected by returning to the shell and running a select star from employees and you'll notice for every instance where the name Dean in the first name and D Davis in the last name existed those records are now gone so we can pretty much run any DML statement through PHP which proves that we can integrate PHP with MySQL quite easily the basics include defining HTML forms and we've shown you two basic input fields but once you can work with textual input fields and you prove that the data is making it to your action page and you ensure that your database connectivity is working with the proper error handling you can then perform any function you'd like and simply consult the PHP documentation for handling the flow of traffic after you have affected database changes so after you've accepted the data um, regardless of the number of fields and types of fields you are to process them in your action page and then send the user either to a good screen or a bad screen or a positive or negative screen but we've effectively managed to integrate PHP with MySQL simply use the MySQL I API and you should basically have no problems because it's tuned for version 4.13 of MySQL.